Karen. Yes. You know how every once in a while you read a book that changes everything? Oh, yeah. Well, that is exactly what happened when I read the New York Times bestseller, Proof of Heaven, by Dr. Eben Alexander. Nice. Now, this book is a personal accounting from Dr. Alexander of his near-death experience. What fascinated me the most about this book was not just his story, but in fact, when you frame it with the knowledge that he is a world-renowned academic neurosurgeon who could perhaps easily explain the experience with scientific studies and facts if the experience was not truly real, Mm -hmm. it kind of puts the story into a, such a bigger light that it was one of the first dominoes that helped topple my skeptical mindset. Mm -hmm. So you might be asking yourself, why is Will telling us all this? Well, it turns out that on today's episode, we have the distinct honor and absolute pleasure to get the chance to have a conversation with Dr. Alexander himself. That's right. New York Times bestselling author of Proof of Heaven and so many other books is with us today on The Skeptic Metaphysicians. My name is Will. And I'm Karen. And unlike Mulder and Scully, we both want to believe. So we've embarked on a journey of discovery. We've talked to people deeply entrenched in the spiritual and metaphysical world. We've thrown ourselves into weird and wonderful experiences. I even joined a coven of witches. And wait. You joined a coven? Yep, all in the interest of finding something. Anything. That will prove that there's something beyond this physical. Three dimensional world we all live in. This is the, the Skeptic, Skeptic Metaphysicians. Hi, I'm Will. And I'm Karen. Today's main topic revolves around the reality of life after death. Dr. Eben Alexander spent over 25 years as an academic neurosurgeon, including. 15 years at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, the Children's Hospital, and Harvard Medical School in Boston. Over those years, he personally dealt with hundreds of patients suffering from severe alterations in their level of consciousness. So he thought he'd had a really good idea of how the brain generates consciousness, mind, and spirit. That is, until November of 2008, when he was driven into a coma by a rare and mysterious bacterial infection forcing him to spend a week in a coma, his prospects for survival diminishing rapidly. Now, on the seventh day, to the surprise of everyone, he started to awaken with memories of a fantastic odyssey deep into another realm, more real than this earthly one. His story offers a crucial key to the understanding of reality and human consciousness and is going to have a major effect on how we all here on this planet view spirituality soul, and the non-material realm. He's the author of Proof of Heaven, Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife, which debuted as number one on the New York Times bestseller list and remained in the top 10 for over a year. He's since been a guest on the Dr. Oz Show, Super Soul Sunday with Oprah Winfrey, 2020, Good Morning America, Fox and Friends, and his story has even been featured on the Discovery Channel and the Biography Channel. He's been interviewed for over 400 national and international radio and internet programs, and his books are available in over 40 countries worldwide and have been translated into over 30 languages. Welcome to the show, Dr. Eben Alexander. Dr. Alexander, I'm not sure I have the right words to express how thrilled we are to have you join us on the show today. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. Well, I, thank you for saying that. It makes me feel better. It makes me feel good. <laughs> uh, now, doctor, when I read your book, I was left stunned. I'd been to skeptic, second guessing everything I'd heard about life after death. Along comes a book from a very well-respected neurosurgeon that claimed to have proof of the afterlife. And I was thrown for a complete loop. I mean, if anyone is going to be able to debunk all the new age stuff that's been thrown around these days, it definitely would have to be you, right? But your book goes in the complete opposite direction. Now, I can't recommend reading your book enough to our audience, but for those that may not have had the chance to do so, can you give us a quick recount of the story? Yeah, I think, and very briefly, I should point out that the reason my story is so important to the scientific community is because it completely violates all the tenets of modern neuroscience uh, in its uh, mistaken notions of the brain creating consciousness. And that's where uh, I think my story has the most value. Because really the disease I had, a severe case of gram-negative bacterial meningoencephalitis, is a perfect model for human death because of its selective destruction of the neocortex, the outer surface of the brain, and the brainstem. And that's why to have the experience I had 
is so remarkable. And in fact, there's a medical case report on my medical records by three doctors not involved in my care, but fascinated by my recovery. That's in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases in September 2018. And they make two very powerful points to just confirm what I did in proof of heaven. One is they strengthen my argument that my brain could not have had any kind of dream or hallucination, much less the most profound experience of my entire lifetime. And how did that happen? Especially at a time when my brain was demonstrably most offline. That's a real shocker. And then the second stunning kind of feature of the case report is my survival. The fact that, you know, over two months, I ended up having a complete return of all my memories and then some, and then, uh, you know, being in the peak of health for the next 15 years, which is what I've really witnessed. Now, to get back to your question, very uh, briefly explaining my journey, it was in the setting of amnesia. That's very important to point out because that's an atypical feature of my NDE that I had no memories of Eben Alexander's life. No words, no language, knowledge of earth, humans, et cetera, was gone. And that empty slate was very important for the depth of where I was to go with all this. I didn't know that at the time, but it only became clear over the months and years of follow-up after the event. And in fact, the essence of my NDE was really in three different levels of the spiritual realm. The first was what I call the earth or my view, a very primitive course on responsive realm. If all I'd done was go there and come back, I would have had a hellish NDE or a distressing NDE, but I went beyond that as most, uh, you know, 95% of NDEers do into a realm that is far more beautiful and kind of our spiritual home, very comforting. The gateway Valley is what I call that. It had a lot of earth-like features. I had no body awareness. I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing, witnessing all that I did see in that realm. But that was a reality far more real than anything I was ever used to. And to kind of put that perspective, you need to realize that's the realm where, for example, we go through life reviews. And a life review is experiencing birth to death, everything in between, all at once. It's completely outside of earth time in a more eternal realm. And that's what I witnessed as, you know, so many other have in that realm, thousands of years of history of reports of people with life reviews. And the life review is really just the golden rule written into the fabric of the universe. Treat others as you would like to be treated because the life review is really a kind of a review of the events of your life, but from the emotional perspective of others around you who were impacted by your thoughts and action. And the life review also is more of a, rem- of a reliving than of a remembering. And it's like this disappearance of boundaries of self. Now, for me, that was only a, a stepping stone in the journey, the gateway valleys, I call it, because music provided yet another portal, just as it had leading me up from the earth where I view these melodies that came with this uh, portal of light that allowed me to ascend to the next level. And likewise, in the, in the gateway valley, there were angelic choirs and hymns, chants, anthems thundering through my awareness that energized yet another portal to a higher level. And those who've read the book, Proof of Heaven, will realize the importance of the guardian angel, my spiritual guide on the butterfly wing, whose identity I only discovered four months after my coma. And I won't go into that uh, in more detail now, but it's a huge part of the story. Um, and and, and then, you should definitely read the book to find out who that was, because that, well, that was a pivotal well, moment in the book. And I went, what? Yeah. <laughs> it is a mind bender, that is for sure. Yeah. But so it's really a story of love and connection and souls and of our interconnectedness. Turns out that the third level, the main level that I visited beyond that gateway valley, that ultra real span, was the core realm. That's where I realized that oneness with the divine is the very source of our conscious awareness. Realize that all the dualities completely resolve as you get to that core level of oneness. And I would cycle through these levels multiple times, but all that is told in much more detail, of course, in proof of heaven and in my many talks about it and in the sequel to that book, which is really uh, living in a mindful universe that was co-written with my partner, Karen Newell. But it turns out I cycled through those levels as discussed many, many a time. And then finally there came a point where I could no longer conjure up the musical melody that led up into that gateway valley. To say I was sad at that moment would be an understatement, but I also knew I could trust in the universe that I would be taken care of as I was promised by that beautiful spiritual guide. And I knew that was the case. And so it turns out then I witnessed thousands of beings going off into the distance, heads bowed, 
murmuring energy. A lot of them with holding candles or hands, stuff like that. And when I called all that and in coming back to this world in my early writings in the weeks after return from coma was the power of prayer. That's how I saw that was, it was drawing me back to this world. And the last thing I saw in the coma experience were the six faces that would kind of bubble up out of the muck, say a few words and disappear again. Now I remember those faces right now, vividly, visually, as realistically as if it all happened this morning. I mean, that's how fresh those memories are. But when I first saw them at the end of my seven day coma, I didn't know who they were. They were important because they were family and friends who were in the ICU room the last 24 hours of coma, as well as Susan Riches, a family friend who channeled to me, you know, if you'd asked me about channeling before my coma, I would have told you it was nonsense as a materialist neuroscientist, but she was there as, as fresh and real as the others. So when I was first waking up in that first day or two and asking uh, uh, people around me, you know, who, who these people were there, one of them was Susan Rinches, who was not there. But of course, as I said, she channeled to me from 120 miles away on Thursday and Friday nights, nights four and five of my coma. Very important to get the timing of all that right. That's explained more fully in the books. But the reality is that kind of channeled experience and those faces I saw helped me to realize that the vast majority of the coma journey had to happen between days one and four of a seven day coma. And I go into why that is so important and it's crucial from the scientific interpretation. And, you know, then I came back to this world and the, those faces, I ha ended up being in and out of a 36 hour psychotic delusional nightmare as I exited the coma journey, but that was only even more instructive because it showed me that the real, a uh, rich spiritual journey that occurred during days one through four of coma really happened. It was way too real to be real as I tried to explain to people. But to me, initially, my doctors had told me that it all had to be a complete fake out and that the dying brain plays all kinds of tricks. And of course, my own neuroscience knowledge hadn't come back yet. I was not yet fully advised and educated about the details of my own medical illness. And it was as I went through that process in the weeks and month or two after coma that I was shocked. Uh, you know, how could I have had any such experience when my brain was so disabled? And how was I doing this big recovery? Where was that mm. coming from? That was a complete shocker. And that's why the medical and scientific communities have been my biggest supporters. Oddly enough, you know, it's not the kind of lay public out there, although thousands of people contacted me after reading Proof of Heaven because it reminded them of a similar experience they had been through. Just the flavor of, of discussing those realms, how one feels that heart love and that divinity and every bit of that, uh, having been there, even though the words may be imperfect, the words actually convey enough to pe others who have been there that I heard from thousands of other experiencers, many of whom had never shared their story with anybody. And that, of mm. course, is the material of the second book, The Map of Heaven, where we really share how common these experiences are. But Map of Heaven is not my own personal sequel of my journey, but Proof of Heaven and then Living in a Mindful Universe are my own personal story of my journey of discovery. And that includes the 15 years since my coma, working with scientists around the world, coming to a deeper understanding of the nature of consciousness. And it's one that the modern science of consciousness ends up supporting the reality of the afterlife and even of reincarnation. You'll find that, for example, UVADOPS.org, University of Virginia, Division of Perceptual Studies have studied more than 2,700 cases, past life memories in children, suggest reincarnation. 1,700 of those cases are solved. That is, they actually found the person described by the child. And, wow. you know, people hear about this and they may say, well, I don't believe in reincarnation. It doesn't really matter what you believe. The scientific evidence is there. It's very strong. It's good that a big portion of the scientific community takes this seriously. And that community includes quantum physicists, includes a lot of medical doctors and nurses who have witnessed these things in their own patients. And of course, many other experiencers and students of psychology, parapsychology, you know, non-local consciousness, telepathy, all these things are a giant body of evidence that supports consciousness as primary in the universe. And that's really where our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, goes. And the good reality for all of us is that the evidence only leads one way. We'll never be making the stupid mistake of going backwards into the materialist mindset where basically they just said, ignore the evidence, 
debunk it, deny it, don't believe it because it doesn't fit our theoretical models of materialism. And, you know, there's no better way to fool yourself as a scientist than to deny and debunk evidence. You know, Carl Sagan is famous for saying that scientists should never deny evidence because they don't know which evidence is worthy of denial and not. So you really need to take all the evidence, and that's where scientists like those at University of Virginia and other centers around the world have gone far beyond conventional science in coming to a deeper understanding of how all this works and, and explaining the reality of the brain-mind connection and especially the nature of consciousness itself, which seems to be much more unified with the brain as a filter that allows that primordial connected unified mind to come in as a little eddy current of an apparent individual consciousness. But ultimately we find that that is an illusion when we leave the physical brain and body at the time of death. And that's what near death experiences have been trying to tell us for thousands of years about that primacy of consciousness, its interconnectedness, and that it's ongoing after bodily death. Wow. So now I have 10 million questions. <laughs> well, we've only got a certain amount of time, Karen. Yes. So you got to so, limit them to like three. I kind of want to go back quite a bit into this conversation, to, well, not the beginning, but sort of the beginning. So you're a neurologist. I mean, you're a scientific mm. man. You have this experience and you know that putting it out there into that community is really going to risk, potentially risk your reputation, your career. How did you know this was real? Like what compelled you so strongly to, to really get this information out? Well, you know, as I said, when I was first coming out of all this, you know, I was very my brain was very addled. My mental function was kind of up and down, in and out. And my, my doctors were shocked because they thought I had a 10% chance of survival early in the week, a 2% chance of survival by the end of the week, but no chance of recovery at that point. And that's why they recommended taking me off the ventilator, stopping all the antibiotics and just letting, letting me go. And that's when I started coming back to this world and they were surprised and then amazed because I started having a full recovery, which nobody expected was unprecedented in the medical literature. And, you know, to me, I was blissfully ignorant of all that had happened during that week. Uh, I was just kind of coming back like, what are you guys doing here to my family? You know, and they're like, oh my God, what a thing to go through. And then here he is coming back. Initially, it was quite frightening to them because they could tell that my brain was still very impaired. But literally within a few days, that impairment seemed to resolve. And I was coming back very strongly. And I think this is really where the case has so much power and value to the scientific community, because literally, I mean, when the, when the case report was presented, the peer review editors said, well, this is absurd. There's no case like this in the literature of somebody this ill from bacterial meningoencephalitis making a full recovery. So how do you explain it? And the way the three doctors explained it is because I had a near death experience, that's what allows for this kind of recovery because they knew of other cases a miraculous healing and a near-death experience. And, you know, if we paid attention to miraculous healing through history, we should surely pay attention to it now. And these are cases medically vetted by the medical profession and then found to be, you know, recoveries that are inexplicable. So those are mm. well worthy of our attention. And it turns out the lesson is really one about free will and about love and about connection with the universe and a sense of purpose. And what it does is it allows for us to see ourselves with a much more kind of wholesome and uh, purpose-directed interrelationship with the universe. We're here to serve with love and kindness, compassion, mercy, acceptance, forgiveness when necessary. But these are the deep lessons of NDEs that we've been trying for thousands of years to share with the world, originally through various religions, through the messages of the prophets. But now the good news is the science of consciousness and studying near-death experiences is really taking us to the whole next level of learning this deep and profound lesson of connection that is shown to us through the life review of, of near-death experiences going back thousands of years where we realize when we experience the life review as those around us and not as ourselves. So if we're busy handing out pain and suffering to others, in the life review, you receive that. And that's why I would say that I think our biggest notions of hell have come from people who had a life review where they'd been so busy handing out pain and suffering to others that when they had to feel it on the receiving end as part of the life review corrective process, it didn't feel good. They didn't like it. 
And hell is a, a very good description of that. So really, I mean, NDEers come back, 90% of them over thousands of years across all belief system, many of whom had been agnostic or atheist, they come back believing 90% of them believe in a a powerful, loving force at the core of the universe that actually has an influence in our lives. And I came back realizing it doesn't matter if you want to try and label that force as God or Allah, Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh, Great Spirit. We don't own it. We can't control it. And in the ears have been describing it the same way for thousands of years across all cultures as this mm. infinitely loving God force. That is not judgmental. In fact, the judgment really seems to come kind of from our higher soul and soul group and not really, you know, it's just an embarrassment in the uh, setting of that light and love of that realm to witness the things we did in life review that were selfish and greedy are just horrible. This is why it's so important. I am so glad as a materialist neuroscientist that I was rescued from the oblivion of continuing to believe my materialist nonsense that there was no meaning to life, that it was, you know, birth to death and nothing more, uh, that we're all just chemical reactions and electron fluxes, giving us an illusion of conscious reality, an illusion of free will, and to realize that that is all a myth perpetrated by materialist scientists who have no clue what consciousness is and how to explain it. And that is why this uh, modern effort by scientists to examine consciousness and the nature of reality is so incredibly important in the current era. And it involves mm -hmm. an awakening of humanity that will also necessitate that we take proper stewardship for this planet and discontinue our very greedy and selfish, you know, addiction to fossil fuels, <laughs> corporate greed at the energy industry, plastic pollution, twice the size of Texas and the Pacific Ocean. These are all results of the false sense of separation of materialism. And the more we realize we're part of the universe and part of each other, we're all bound together through this force of love, the more we realize that it's imperative we start behaving differently than we've been behaving. Homo sapiens is really not as wise as it, it labels itself to be when you look at the world today. And it's high time we took proper stewardship of this planet, quit to, you know, burning fossil fuels and elevating the temperature of the planet before it becomes an unlivable nightmare for our children and grandchildren, and especially when you realize the seriousness of that reincarnation literature and acknowledge the fact, as Jim Tucker and Ian Stevenson, who have done a lot of the reincarnation work at UVA, will tell you, our memories are covered over at age five or six so that you don't remember. Most of us as adults, teenagers and adults don't remember past life memories, but they're there in children. And they're very real. And in fact, they often explain phobias, behaviors, things like that in these children who remember past life. But do note that at age five or six, they start getting covered over. So that by the time they're an early teenager, they don't remember any of it. That's why mm. most don't remember that, but we should pay attention to the scientific literature that tells us that a lot of children do remember past life memories and that they're very important in truly understanding our journey as a soul, who we are why we face the various hardships in life that we do and how we can learn to grow from those hardships, challenges, and difficulties and not just fear them and run away from them. And you mentioned being rescued from that type of thought process. And so I would say that you now are helping to rescue a lot of people out here that are stuck in that loop. To say that this kind of thing is really hard to believe is an understatement because we have a lot of people in the scientific community who have poo-pooed any, that you just mentioned that, that this is really just chemicals firing in your brain and all that kind of stuff. But even in your book, you go, or proof of heaven anyway, you actually go into, as a scientist, potential explanations for what you went through. And then you debunk each and every one of them in an appendix in the back of the book, which is fantastic to hear a neuroscientist, an esteemed member of the scientific community like you explain, look, all this stuff is garbage. This is real. That is incredibly inspiring to me anyway, because as a pragmatist, I need someone like you to say, yeah, this stuff is real. You can believe it. You can take it to the bank. Now, the question that jumps to mind immediately once reading your book is, your experience was very different than a lot of the experiences that you hear from other NDEers, right? You didn't see a tunnel that took you into a bright light. You didn't see your loved ones at the other end of it. 
How do you account for that? Why was yours, your experience so different than others that we've heard before? I wouldn't say mine so different at all, especially if you uh, look at Bruce Grayson's In the E Scale, which he published in 1983. It has 16 different elements in four broad categories. And the maximum score you can get for an NDE is 32. If you score seven on his testing, it's an NDE. I get a 28 or a 29, depending on how you score it. So I had, mine wow. was a, absolutely right down the alley. In fact, the only reason I lost points was mainly due to my amnesia and not having mm -hmm. a personal life review. I couldn't have an Eben Alexander life review. But I ended up seeing uh, life reviews and reincarnation in gigantic form in two visions I had. One I call the flying fish vision. The other, much more powerful at a later passage through the core realm, was the Indra's net vision. And that was a very profound kind of experience of the interwoven soul lines of all of our souls involved in this evolution of consciousness. Very profound experience. So. I think that's the important thing to get is when you really know about NDEs, study NDEs a lot, mine ended up getting an incredibly high score. It was every bit of that, but that amnesia was a very kind of key sticking point because it's so unusual. And yet when I first came out of coma, to me, amnesia made perfect sense because I was still harboring that outmoded belief that memories might be stored in the neocortex. But of course, I didn't yet know that all my memories were going to come back. And it'd be even more complete than they were before coma, which is what happened over about two months. So it's really all, uh, you know, this is why I had to share the story. Once I've figured out what had happened, as I tell in the book, Proof of Heaven, that happened four months after coma, when I received a picture in the mail from a birth sister, and that's how I identified that beautiful, loving guardian angel on the butterfly wing. That's when I realized it all was way too real to be real because it actually occurred. That was the, uh, the real wake up call, the identification of that beautiful spiritual guy. And that's when I really dove in, in earnest. Now I'll point out for you and your audience, the scientific evidence for the reality of these experiences is already overwhelming. There was a contest held in 2021, bigelowinstitute.org is your resource site for the 29 winning essays of that contest. But it was held by an entrepreneur in Las Vegas who wanted to know what's the best scientific evidence for continuation of consciousness after permanent bodily death. He held a, a contest in 2021. They ended up receiving 204 essays, all from people who had spent at least five years scientifically researching the afterlife question. So very high quality, not from, you know, armchair philosophers who know nothing about this and who commented on it from a position of complete ignorance. These people know what they're talking about. If you go to BigelowInstitute.org, you can read all 29 winning essays for free. I highly recommend do that. And you'll realize after reading any of these essays that we're already pretty far along the pathway to a scientific kind of explication of the reality of these experiences. And then we'll need to move into understanding mechanism much better. But the reality is that first place essay by Jeffrey Mishlov really hits it out of the park for those who absolutely insist on a very strong leading edge scientific analysis. I would recommend several of the essays, but in particular, uh, Pim Van Lommel's essay, the second place winner, also Bernardo Castro, who's, uh, these are all also supporters of our book, living in a mind of the universe, these scientific endorsers. And also Julie Beischel, she wrote a beautiful scientifically derived essay on the, on the reality of, of mediumship and, uh, mediums that, uh, interact with the souls of departed loved ones. Uh, and Julie Beischel has done a lot of very good scientific work, fully supporting the reality of this. So it's no longer a question of whether or not this is compatible with science. You, you, what you end up finding is a scientist is either familiar with the data or they're willfully ignorant. And there are enough of them around of the willfully ignorant ones who keep claiming things, even though they really don't have any basis for knowing it at all. Uh, like Sean Carroll, I had the pleasure of debating mm -hmm. Sean. He's a brilliant physicist and I really love his physics work. But, uh, this was back in uh, intelligence squared in 2014, a debate with him and Steve Novella, but I must tell you that he has no no experience to be answering these questions of, of the spiritual nature. And yet he keeps claiming as a particle physicist that he has proof there is no God, there is no heaven. And I would say he's mm. dead wrong. Put him up against uh, all those uh, winning Bigelow Institute essays and you'll realize 
he might know a, a quite a bit about quantum physics, but he's not very educated about this particular question. So there are a lot of scientists who are. If you go to scientificandmedical.net, go to galileocommission.org, you will find these are groups that I've worked with from around the world, scientists who realize that the materialist model that pretends, you know, physicalism, that only the physical world exists, the brain creates consciousness, that that it that isn't supported by the evidence at all. And we are much better off looking at consciousness as being a unified field that's interconnected with our brain serving as a filter that allows us to access that level, the mental layer of the universe. But the interesting thing is when our brain and body die, it's not a shrinking down of conscious awareness to nothing, as a materialist would predict, but it's a liberation from the shackles of the prison. So it's an enlargement and enrichment and a reconnection of consciousness. So it's the complete opposite of what materialism supports. And, and yet there are millions and millions of NDEs out there around this world to attest to the reality of this. It happens in something like 15% of cardiac arrest patients. They have a profound spiritual wow. experience that can be labeled an NDE, uh, probably something like 5% or more of Americans and, and Western Europeans have had a near death experience. And these after death communications are even more common probably to the tune of 20% or so of people having a very powerful connection with a loved one who's left the physical plane that to them completely proves the reality of their ongoing connections. And in this regard, we just lost one of our great pioneers of uh, Bill Guggenheim, who wrote uh, with his former wife, Judy Guggenheim in the mid 1990s, the book, uh, hello from heaven, which is about over 300 after death communication cases that they investigated. And unfortunately, Bill has just recently passed over himself a few weeks ago. And Bill was one of my greatest mentors and, uh, I, I, I miss him from the physical world, but I've already had Darren and I have already had beautiful contact with him from the, from the, uh, you know, the other side and he's wow. And, well, <laughs> and I, I was just going to ask you about that. We've talked to several, well, many people that have had NDEs. And they have all, well, at least the vast majority of them have told us that they have changed, obviously their perspective, their beliefs, but so many of them have developed these spiritual gifts, whether it's channeling or the ability to connect to source. And I wanted to ask you if that had been your experience as well. Sounds well, like I, it has. I, well, it, it has been in a huge way, but it, in many ways it's been cultivated. I realized, you know, in the first two years or so after my coma, I read more than 150 books, quantum physics, uh, everything about brain mind connection. I could get my hands on spiritual texts, mm -hmm. East and West going back thousands of years. I really wanted to get to it, but I realized that ultimately if I wanted to have any kind of deep understanding of my journey, I had to explore consciousness. I had to meditate. I had to use centering prayer. I had to go within. And so beginning about two years post COVID, that's what I started doing. And I wasn't just doing it randomly or kind of chaotically. I was quite focused. I had heard about a technology called binaural beat brainwave entrainment. It's a phenomenon discovered in the mid 1800s by Wilhelm Heinrich wow. Dove. It basically says if you put a pure tone in one ear, say a hundred Hertz, hundred cycles per second in one ear. And as an example, 104 Hertz in the other ear. So a four Hertz difference between the two you end up getting a four hertz signal somewhere in the brain. Heinrich Dove got this. And then in the late 20th century, uh, Robert Monroe investigated binaural beats in the in, uh, uh, instigation of out of body experiences and other investigators use binaural beats to enhance remote viewing, you know, the psychic spy abilities mm -hmm. and what have you. The remote viewing is one of the most scientifically validated forms of non-local consciousness in the world. It's been beautifully validated by Jessica Utz, head of the American Statistical Association in her presidential address in 2015, where she talks about precognition and remote viewing, saying the statistical scientific evidence for their reality is beyond dispute. And yet you find sources like Wikipedia, which is made up of rampant militant materialists claiming that uh, remote viewing is pseudoscience. Well, that's because Wikipedia is pseudo encyclopedia. <laughs> Well, they have no business, you know, any encyclopedia edited by the lowest common denominator can't be worth wasting your time on time to get rid of that. But uh, that unfortunately is the sad truth If people use Wikipedia for uh, information, especially about spiritual matters. 
they're going to find that there's this Gestapo that is right mm. there to smash any kind of hint of spirituality emerging on Wikipedia. But luckily right. there are plenty of excellent resources out there that show the deep truth of remote viewing and other things. But that was my key in a meditation was using a binaural beat brainwave entrainment. And in fact, my partner, Karen Newell, who had been very busy with binaural beats long before I discovered them, she ended up under my encouragement, she and her business partner, uh, Kevin Cossey, who's a sound engineer, electrical and mechanical engineer, but he uses it also for sound engineering. They ended up forming a company, Sacred Acoustics, and I was their alpha tester from the get-go. Uh, I use Sacred Acoustics daily, an hour to a day. I use it for meditation. Very powerful technique. It allows us to be liberated from the here, now, and the sense of self of the physical body and brain. And that's where we have used our workshops, Karen and I have, to prove that many of us who have never had a near-death experience can come into the same kinds of knowledge that prove the reality of the NDE using binaural beat brainwave and trained uh, enhanced meditation. Uh, mm. If you go to sacredacoustics.com, you can learn a lot more. You can look at a lot of the testimonials there and download a free 20-minute OM file, listen to that with headphones. But for me, I could not dispense with my tones. I use them not just to return to my NDE to recover from memories, but really to cultivate and interact with the various denizens and guides and entities, and especially that infinitely loving God force at the core of the universe through my meditative efforts with sacred acoustic. I must confess, I have not yet duplicated the full blown ultra reality of my near death experience. It was so prominent. I talk about that in proof mm -hmm. of heaven, how it's much more real than this existence. You know, people often think, well, an NDE must be kind of dreamlike and murky. No, this is dreamlike and murky. That is sharp and clear, memorable, defined, and transformational uh, in ways that mm. indie ears know full well and will describe by the millions. And this is where I think it's important for all of us to learn to go within. We can all start to cultivate our rich relationship to the universe at large. Now, I am absolutely giddy to hear you <laughs> say things like this. This is exactly what I've been looking for my entire life, it feels like. And I think we should note that one of the most astounding things about your experience is that you, you hadn't really studied NDEs or anything like that before. So when you came out, I believe it was your son or somebody in your family asked you to go ahead and write it down before you look into it. And then after you, it was all written down, that's when you started looking into it and finding the similarities. So that in and of itself is astounding to, to think that you had no knowledge of NDEs until that point, And it was all proven to you by third party verification. Right. And, and that was really, uh, both my sons, Evan and Bond have been tremendous gifts in this kind of unraveling of this journey. Bond, of course, was that 10 year old boy that I saw at the end of my journey and knew I had to come back to this world, even though I did not recognize him. And Evan, the fourth, my uh, older son was the one he had been there at the bedside, holding my hand, you know, with other family members while I was deep in coma. And then he'd gone back to school as I was starting to show some signs of recovery, just to finish off some final exams before he raced back home right before Thanksgiving, two days after I got out of the hospital. And I remember he, he drove overnight to surprise me because he'd heard I was up all night because I couldn't sleep. I was so energized because of my coma. And he got there about 6 a.m., gave me a big hug. And he told me later, he said, it was like there was a light shining within me. I was far more present than I'd ever been before. And I remember telling him it was way too real to be real. You know, that was the hint from my doctors. You know, I, my neuroscience knowledge was still not back. It was still partially and temporarily offline because of the illness. And yet my doctors were so shocked that I'd actually been able to leave the hospital making conversation, able to communicate. That was such a complete shock to them, given what they expected of this illness. They kept telling me, well, the dying brain plays all kinds of tricks. We have no idea how you're coming back to us, but you can forget about whatever you experience because the dying brain is, uh, tricky. And I believed mm. that, uh, and that's, and in fact, I'd never really read the NDE literature. I always thought, well, it's nonsense. You know, it's hallucinations of the dying brain Who cares. But now I realize, my God it's so much more than that. It's what happens when you die, these incredible visions. And so I dove in deep to the literature. But only after I had written about 20,000 words of my own story. And that was due to my advice of Eben the Fourth. 
he told me, write it all down before you read anyone else's NDE account. And that was very, very important. That way I mm. knew that everything that I'd written down about my own experience was my own experience and nowhere was it tainted by someone else's NDE or their experience. And, uh, as I said, when you, when you really line it up against other NDEs in a rigorous, you know, academic scholarly fashion, it scores very high on the, uh, on the Bruce Grayson NDE scale. One of the th things that surprised me, let's say that is, is that because when you first, uh, I don't know if the right term is woke up in the NDE, where when you went to a coma and you became aware you were in this muck, this darkness, this area that didn't seem pleasant for lack of a better word, but then you rose up into the other realms, which were the heaven that people talk about. What do you think that is? What, what is that muck that you awakened to in the beginning? Well, you know, it's what I call the earthworm's eye view. And uh, it was a very primitive course, unresponsive realm, like being in dirty jello, had no body awareness, uh, body image at any point during any of this journey. And in that earthworm eye view, it really was kind of, you know, it's negative when I talk about it, when I describe it, people think, whoa, that's kind of foreboding. But I, just, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it was, I had no memory of anything different. So to me, it was like, this is the way it is. Mm. And I had no complaints. Uh, you know, it was not foreboding until the very, very, very end when I recognized the face of that 10 year old boy and realized I had to get back, whatever back meant. And now all of a sudden I realized it was very important whether I survived or not and what this outcome was. And yet I had no idea what the rules of this world were. And that's why, you know, my, my higher soul ended up kind of ushering me back in some fashion or another. I came back to this world, but that earthworm I view was very primitive and, and coarse. And initially I thought, you know, that was the best consciousness my brain could muster soaking in pus. But in reading more and more of the literature, especially when I started with the Tibetan book of the dead, uh, and other books of the dead, things like that, Egyptian book of the dead, um, to me, especially the Bardos in the Tibetan book of the dead was very much like my, uh, my earthworm eye view. So I came to see it as probably a more universal layer. It's not one that you often hear about in NDEs. People are so busy sharing the beautiful, you know, loving, uh, incredible, uh, mirth and joy, spiritual home nature of NDEs and not necessarily some of the kind of ragged edges around the entry points, et cetera. But to me, it was just part of the experience that I had to report along with everything else. But the deep reality is by the end of my journey, cycling through, you know, the, the beautiful gateway valley, then up into the core and then back down to the earth from my view. And through these multiple times, I came to realize the ultimate reality of that loving core of the universe. And that's what showed me so purely. This is never a battle between good and evil. It can seem that way at our level, way out here in the kind of lowest material realm. But the closer you get to the spiritual core of the universe, the more it is pure love, that God force. There is no battle between good and evil. And in fact, I would say the good and evil is a gradient that drives our evolution towards the good. That's what that life review is all about. That's what NDEs and their contribution to human knowledge are all about is coming to a deeper understanding of how we, we are all part of this infinitely loving God force of the universe. And religions have tried to teach us that for thousands of years, but religions tend to get uh, locked up into ideologies and into conflicts that are perceived, but not necessarily real from the deep spiritual level where there's such unity from the voice of indie ears, no matter what their religious faith, they come back uh, with these discussions of that love, that kindness, that compassion, mercy, acceptance. These are the principles that really guide that spiritual world. And the more we understand that and the, the kind of uh, leading edge of NDEs to, to lead us towards this deeper knowledge of unification and the binding force of love that can bring us into wholeness and healing, that's where the world can really grow into a positive transformation. Now, you mentioned religion, and a word that goes hand-in-hand hand with religion often is prayer. And you mentioned prayer and the power of prayer earlier. So with your experiences and, and everything that you believe, how would you define prayer? I think prayer, for me, it changed. I will point that out. Before my coma, and I really had not prayed for about seven years. I explained a lot of that proof of heaven in many of my talks. But I had a dark night of the soul, perceived rejection from my birth mother. 
in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. So not much prayer in the recent years before my coma, but many attempts before that. And sometimes I felt very successful. I've taken my sons to church, things like that. I enjoyed that attempting to see the power of prayer, although for much of my life, you know, it wasn't as obvious to me as it was, for example, to my father. He was a, a neurosurgeon, very uh, advanced knowledge scientifically, but for him, he grew up during the depression, was a combat surgeon in the second world war, and he never had any conflict between a belief in a loving personal God and the power of prayer in his work as a surgeon and his knowledge of science. But for me, I made the mistake of, of thinking that science was the, you know, the New York Times Scientific American version of science, which is very materialistic and therefore is denying much of the evidence of the spiritual nature of the universe and of our, ourselves. But that is where they're all waking up now, including even Scientific American, uh, with some of the essays that Bernardo Castro has published there recently that show the power of idealism, that is, of this mental model of the universe with the mental layer being primary and causing all that we see emerging in the physical layer of the universe. So it's, it's really about modern science, quantum informed science. In fact, quantum physics in many ways demands this mental layer of the universe, that it not be some simplistic mechanistic layer, but that what explains kind of human history and human destiny much better is realizing the power of our free will to kind of organize how those events unfold. And that's what shows us that it's not just some bottom-up causality based on the you know, subatomic particles in our brains and around us and bodies following the laws of physics, chemistry, biology, but there's something much more afoot to explain human destiny. And that's where we really need to invoke that mental layer of the universe. And that's where I would say that top-down uh, kind of notion of spirituality from near-death experiences is so much part of that emerging science. And the quantum physics, in fact, that old saying that nature abhors a vacuum. Well, in fact, uh, quantum physics abhors any universe that doesn't involve that mental layer of top-down causality. And that's exactly what we argue in our book, Living in a Mind of the Universe, The Primordial Mind Hypothesis. And a lot of the scientific world is starting to move towards a model like that, where we have that primary God mind that is split into these little dissociated eddy currents of individual self-awareness, but that then see rejoin the primordial mind, but in a way that preserves in a fashion that I call viscosity, some line between a past life and a current life. So it's not just that we are like a drop in the ocean between lives and that it's a complete mix and that there's never any preservation of the information from one life into the next life, because in fact, that's where the past life memories and children are so indicative of a strong kind of ongoing current of uh, facts involved in one life that then become involved in the next life. Uh, and that's where transpersonal psychology, the work of Carl Jung and uh, Stan Groff, Michael Newton, Brian Weiss, Robert Schwartz and others is so important because they have uncovered through hypnotic regression and meditation, other techniques of recovering past life memories, that people can discover this on their own. Their past life memories can contribute tremendously to understanding the issues of this life. And that's why this mm -hmm. knowledge of our bigger nature and that we've been here before, that there's a preservation of kind of a history of our choices and behaviors, sentient beings in the past that plays out in our current incarnation. And the best way to bring that to a most successful fulfillment in maximum growth of a soul during a lifetime is to fully open to the reality of this loving interconnectedness we share with the universe at large and that we have a responsibility as souls to help all of our fellow souls along that pathway of love and coming into wholeness as best we can. And that's where yeah. we end up getting tremendous kind of soul growth and personal benefit out of these efforts to connect with the universe at large through meditation, centering prayer, other ways of connecting. We don't have to depend on 2000 year old dogma reported in books where some of the church fathers handling those books are afraid of people who have had actual personal experience and will try and tell you it's the devil's work. Well, that's not true. In fact, the vast majority of NDEs lead towards uh, this notion of love, kindness, compassion, unconditional love, mercy and acceptance, forgiveness gratitude, all of these profound capabilities of the human soul to help us to grow.
And that's where I think all of us can benefit from awakening to these deeper truths. No doubt about it. Absolutely. Now, I could listen to you speak for literally days. I just sit here and listen to you speak. It is so rewarding to hear someone with your credentials speak about this stuff in such a matter of fact way that helps us really come to terms with the fact that we're much more than this three-dimensional body that we inhabit. I know you are an incredibly busy man. We don't want to take up any more of your time. We're going to lay in direct links to your books, Proof of Heaven, Living in a Mindful Universe, all those books, as well as some of the resources that you mentioned in the interview. So if you're interested in doing further research, please feel free to go to skepticmetaphysician.com and go to Dr. Alexander's episode page. You will see all the links directly listed there, as well as Dr. Alexander's website and social media accounts so that you can reach out to him directly if you're so inclined. Doctor, I I have at least 52 more questions that I wish I had more time for, but maybe at some point in the future, we can have you back and continue the conversation. Well, I I think that'd be a great idea. And what I recommend is we also include my partner and co-author of Living in a Mindful Universe, Karen Newell. She's been a a very rich source of spiritual wisdom to me, Uh, of course, uh, is an expert in uh, sound-induced meditative states. And maybe uh, we should reconnect and have Karen join us next time so people can hear somebody who really understands all this. That would be great. We would love that. That'd Absolutely love that. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your expertise in the information you provided to us. And thank you so much for sharing your story because people like you standing up and talking about this kind of thing is what's going to help change the world. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Well, Will and Karen, thank you so much for having me on. I greatly appreciate it and uh, look forward to our next conversation. As do we.